welcome to Catalyst Church Online Campus. Welcome to Wisdom's Walk. If you're joining us for the first time, I would like to welcome you, ask you, maybe take a moment, reach out to our connection team. Let them know you're here. There should be some instructions on your screen there, and they're going to help you, know, you become a part of the Catalyst Church family. We just want to honor you in that way. And if you're joining us on YouTube, do take a moment, you know, click the subscribe button uh, so you can join us each week as we upload new studies here on Wisdom's Walk. And I would also like to thank you for your generous, your faithful giving to the ministries of Catalyst Church. For those of you who are giving to God through you know, God's stewardship principles, you can do so securely on our online platform. Can I just take a moment and ask the Lord's blessing as well over the tithes and the offerings this week? Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and your provision in our lives. Lord, as we honor you with the tithes and the offerings, we ask that you would receive from us with the gratitude that we are giving. But Lord, would you receive it from us in a, with an eye of leveraging towards souls, stories, lives transformed by the grace of Jesus? That's our desire. So Lord, I ask that you would bless those who give today, according to your word, pour out your blessings upon them. We honor you, we worship you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you. So several months back, I was, oh, I was home organizing a closet, uh, and I came across a box of my old high school memorabilia. And inside, I found my old yearbooks. So I, I began you know, thumbing through them, you're recognizing some old friends and classmates. And I found myself realizing some of these people I hadn't even thought of since high school. I mean, our lives, you know, moved in different trajectories. And, you know, that's that. You've experienced the same thing, I'm sure. And as I flipped through, though, I also realized, somewhat to my chagrin, there were plenty of people in there who I had no idea who they even were. I didn't recognize their picture. I didn't recognize their name. I felt kind of bad. Until I did the math and figured out, you know, if I don't even know who they were, they probably didn't even know me either, so, you know, we're even. But still, it seems odd that we can spend years with someone on a similar journey in the same geographic location, the same hallways, same classrooms, same cafeteria and gym, locker rooms, fields, and end up knowing absolutely nothing about them. Well, guess what? The disciple that we're looking at today is the one that we know virtually nothing about. His name shows up on the class roster of Jesus' disciples, but there's no picture to go along with his name. And ironically, we aren't even all that certain of his name, or at least not of the title he's been given. He is the disciple named James, son of Alphaeus. And let's, let's turn to Luke chapter 6. And we're going to see the introduction right there. Uh, you know, So verse 14, this is the list of the apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, J Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. You see there, verse 15, James, son of Alphaeus. Well, the confusion over James' name centers around the fact that not even the gospel authors know what to call him, apparently. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all refer to him as James, the son of Alphaeus, but later on in his gospel, Mark mentions James' mother as being near Jesus during the crucifixion. And in a passing mention, Mark gives James another descriptor. James the, well, actually Mark uses a word that unfortunately doesn't help us much. It's found in, in the gospel of Mark, chapter 15. Let's look there for a minute. So this is actually at the, the crucifixion. It says there in verse 40 of chapter 15 in Mark, some women were there watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary, catch this, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph, and Salome. Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph. Mark calls him James the, and the Greek word is mikras, James the mikras, which literally means small or little, but can be used to indicate many different things. Biblical translators have struggled to pick one of the meanings because it's impossible to do so without making a definite statement about James and about his importance. Mikras can mean, you know, small in size or diminutive. So was Mark saying that James was a tiny little man? I mean, that's not the typical kind of observation Mark would make. 
Mikros can mean smaller in importance. So was Mark saying James was the insignificant disciple? I mean, that's a pretty definitive statement. But is that what Mark meant? For centuries, that is exactly how translators have taken Mikros to mean. And so he's been known as James the Less or James the Lesser. Now, modern translators seem to have settled on the least offensive meaning, but truthfully, it's also the weakest grammatically. It's actually a pretty unlikely meaning, but they've settled on calling him James the Younger. I mean, at least that one isn't offensive, right? Maybe Mark did this on purpose. Maybe he picked a descriptor that purposely said the least about James. Maybe as a clue for later readers that there's something mysterious, hidden, unknown about this disciple. Maybe. That's not really Mark's writing style either, however. So for the sake of confusion, I'll probably use all of the options at some point throughout our brief look today. You're welcome. So if you've been joining us on this study journey through the first followers of Jesus, you may recall something I said about Nathaniel a few weeks back, that it was the people around him which revealed to us more of the details about him than he did himself. Well, with James the Less, you're ready for something entirely different. You want to know what Scripture directly reveals about James the Less? Are you sure? It's, it's powerfully significant. So wait for it. It is nothing. That's right. Scripture directly reveals absolutely nothing about James the Less, other than his name and that he was one of Jesus' disciples. But that's it. The rest of James' story, we have to infer, we have to guess. Well, to... To wrap the shroud of mystery a little tighter, how about this? In John's gospel, he never even mentions the existence of this disciple named James at all. Nothing. Now, we're, we're fairly certain he was a Galilean, like most of the other disciples. In fact, we're pretty, pretty certain that Judas Iscariot was the only one who was not from Galilee. But we don't know where James the Less hailed from. We don't know where he was born. I actually don't know any of the details surrounding his being chosen by Jesus or if he chose to follow first or when or how he moved from the general ranks of the following crowd and into the lofty role of disciple. Scripture records none of that for us. We can assume he must have said something to Jesus at some point, but nothing is preserved. No conversations, no questions, none of his actions. I guess we can also safely assume that James the less fled in fear the night Jesus was betrayed, because Scripture tells us they all abandoned Jesus that night. So now you can see why I wonder if maybe Mark chose a mysterious, hidden descriptor for James as a clue to this seemingly invisible disciple. So what is significant about James the less, then? Why bother studying him at all? Well, I mentioned that this one was different than the others, and here's how I think it's important to study James the Lesser. It is what Scripture does not say about him that matters. The silence concerning him draws our focus onto something else about him, the total absence of distinction in his story. See, James the Less is surrounded by questions. Who was he? Where did he come from? What kind of disciple was he? What was his personality? Why is there nothing about him? we can't help but be struck by the nothingness in his participation in Jesus' story. But you probably are aware, there is no such thing as nothing in Scripture. Even a supposed silence can speak volumes. I think James' nothingness raises two important questions for us. First, what if the nothingness is on purpose? If James is never portrayed as seeking prominence, maybe he never did. He was content to play a behind-the-scenes role in Jesus' ministry. Maybe James, you know, unlike so many of the other disciples, maybe he never challenged Jesus to prove himself or tried to manipulate Jesus in any way. Maybe James never sought out power for himself, never tried to leverage Jesus' influence to enrich himself. He never name-dropped or never got in the way. Could James' lack of story point to what a supportive, ever-present followership could look like? 
you know, after the two Sons of Thunder brothers tried to gain positions of prominence and all the other disciples got indignant with them, Jesus used the occasion to make a powerful admonition. And it's found in, in Matthew chapter 20, so we'll turn there for a moment. Matthew chapter 20, and it's in verse, verse 25 is where we're going to begin. Or how about 24? When the ten other disciples heard what James, and this is James and John, the sons of Zebedee, had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I, for one, I can see James the Lesser grasping this truth and running with it quite easily, never trying to rise above his fellow Christ followers, but humbly serving without need for acclaim or fanfare or even attention. You know, there's another question that James the Less and his nothingness raises. It's a tough question, actually, and it requires some deep thinking on our parts. What does it say about us that we are dissatisfied with the lack of interesting detail or apparent significance of James' story? James' non-story exposes our bias towards seeking prominence, towards seeking glory and notoriety and fame and celebrity. But only the standout disciples are interesting to us? Only stories rich with detail and drama are worth knowing and remembering? You know, we need to walk carefully here, or we risk turning faith into a popularity contest. Following Christ is never about who has the most pictures and the most mentions in the yearbook. Some things we absolutely know for certain about James. Jesus selected him. Jesus trained him and invested in him directly. Jesus empowered him. Jesus sent him out as a witness. Jesus chose James the Less to be a foundation of his church. Maybe we don't need to know the reasons Jesus chose James. Maybe it shouldn't matter to you and I who Jesus chooses to do what Jesus chooses them to do. Maybe the memorability of Christ's followers isn't as important to Jesus as it is to us. Maybe James the Less was the first of Jesus' followers to end up in the true faith yearbook mentioned in the New Testament letter to the Hebrews. Let's turn there and look at that for a minute. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 33. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, and these are nameless people here. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. And others were killed with a sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves holes in the ground. This list of those who have suffered in their service for Christ, and it continues. In fact, it has never ended. There have always been martyrs. There have always been countless to us, nameless to us, but of course counted and named by Christ. You know, there's one other thing that James non-story exposes in us. We have a preferment, probably actually an unhealthy preoccupation, with finding significance in doing. We measure our worth and meaning through performance. See, we judge James as insignificant 
because we can't identify anything he actually did. His story isn't interesting to us because there's no record of his accomplishments or his exploits. We value people who do important things, which I guess could also be restated as we devalue those who don't seem to do memorable things. I mean, by way of illustration, look at how we have conversation with someone that you know, we just met. What question do we ask right up front? Oh, well, what do you do? Come on, admit it. We rank people's importance based on that question, as if the answer will tell us all we need to know about them. I mean, how would we react? We meet James the Less in heaven and ask him what he did for Jesus, and he says, let my story in Scripture speak for itself. I'm not sure we'd know what to do with that. Now, I'm not saying Jesus is cool with us doing nothing for him. I don't believe that's true at all. I believe Jesus has very high expectations of his followers. I believe he calls and he empowers and he sends and he expects results in performance from us. I just don't believe that he needs what we do for him to be always worthy of memorializing or drawing attention to. I mean, unless the attention from our actions and our stories is being drawn exclusively to him, we run the risk of getting in his way. So what's our wisdom walk for today from James? Well, I think we need to keep clearly in our minds and in our hearts this simple truth. Jesus calls all types of people, and he uses all types of people. Jesus empowers and mobilizes all types of people. But make no mistake, when it came time to describe the motivating impulse which he wanted all his followers to be remembered by, it wasn't importance or prominence or voted most likely to anything. His followers are to be servants, serving him, serving others, serving one another. And when Paul wrote to the believers in Philippi, I think he kind of effectively wrote Jesus' yearbook epitaph. You know, you know the passage, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It's such a familiar passage because it is so powerful. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul writes, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, ironically, James the less, the disciple we seem to have the least to learn about, may be the one we have the most need to learn from. Well, on behalf of our Catalyst Church family, I want to thank you for taking the time to study with me today, and I invite you to join us next week as we learn about Jude the Humble. God bless you, and have a great week.